Hello, and welcome to our exciting course for the fall of 2024 called The History of Magic, Witchcraft, and Occultism at the University of Houston. Now, I'm Dr. Ulrey. I'll tell you more about myself in just a little bit here, but you will be looking at me for a lot of this class. Uh, I make the course set up so that you'll have a video for every module, and then you'll have a number of tasks to complete along with readings and supporting videos. I try to keep it dynamic. I try to switch things up. I also try to make changes every year, even though we'll be using a set of recordings for this class that I recorded in 2023. In fact, this is a course I've taught a lot of times and in different iterations, and it's on the topic that I find most exciting about my own research uh, into the academic study of religion and being a historian of religion. So I'm going to read through the syllabus with you. Why? It seems like such a silly task. It does sort of go back to the idea that the syllabus is a binding document, even a legal document. It's an agreement between professor and student. So the syllabus sets out as much as what I'm going to do, as much as what you're going to do. And I see my relationship to the syllabus being, yes, I wrote it, but it's up to me to help you succeed in the objectives of the syllabus. And to the degree that I succeed in aiding you in succeeding, then the course is a success. So this is a course that is not adversarial. I want us to all be learning together. Yes, you will be assessed and you will be assessed often. There will be a lot of graded assignments and you will have assignments to do for every module. But the assignments, as I think you'll see, are kind of interesting. And in fact, a lot of students tell me they're pretty fun in the long run. Um, I try to not have the sort of flabby assignments that are compare this and compare that to which you would end invariably the student writes, oh, they're the same, but they're different. For what reasons? Who knows? but they're the same and they're different. So what I do is I try to create assignments that require you to imagine the course material that you've read in a new way, and then to write about it often in a creative way. So you'll be just as likely to write a definition of magic or witchcraft as you are to write a letter to a friend about how you're traveling to meet a fortune teller, or, or you are to design your own magical ritual that does something mean-spirited to someone else and then write a story about it. We'll even have group activities on the discussion forums that will include such things as writing scenes from plays about uh, traditional Zandi African uh, sorcerers and witch doctors. It's, it's a neat class. I think you're going to dig it. But I'll tell you more about that as we move through the syllabus, as we agree to what will be going on before us. Now, I don't think I got the captioning set right <clears throat> on Zoom. There was a big change and update on that and on Canvas. But all the other videos you'll have, I use um, PowerPoint presentations with every video and I include a captioning option through PowerPoint. So everything will be captioned. Now that's one for accessibility for those who may have uh, difficulty hearing or, or have any sort of way that they process uh, more visually than audially. But what students tell me they can do is they can use these uh, captions as like an index. So like, like, oh, what did Ulri say about this? And then you go back and as you're jumping around through the videos, you can use those little screen captions to figure out exactly where it was instead of just bumbling around. Me being of the Gen X persuasion, I'm not good at learning from videos, but I've tried to make some dynamic ones. And uh, the students generally say they're, they're pretty good. All right, here comes the big bad syllabus. All right, so what is our class? Our class is the history of magic, witchcraft, and the occult at, and that is a religious studies course 36601. The course is asynchronous, which means it will never meet at the same time. Now, I just set out that the class meets twice per week, Tuesdays and Thursdays. It's almost like that way a student can think, all right, well, I need to go to class on a Tuesday and on a Thursday. So you, I'll try to get everything up early, very early in the week, preferably Sunday if I can. And then you'll have due dates on Friday nights and Sunday nights. So that's kind of the big thing for you is those due dates. Friday at 11.59 and Sunday at 11.59. Now I would suggest that you log on early, you watch the videos, and then you start doing the assignments early. The reason I don't have them all due on Sunday night is because then half of the students end up doing them all on Sunday and I can watch the quality drop as they try to do too much at once. So I'm forcing the class broken up into pieces instead of you just having like one week, all the videos, all the tasks, bam. 
I'm forcing those to be broken up. Even though you'll have availability each week to all of the things at once, I want you to find the best way for your schedule to get through the course materials. And we'll we'll talk about that as we go along. And if you have any questions about um, timing and figuring out your workload and whatnot, I welcome you to email me and we'll brainstorm and work through that. That's something I'm really interested in doing. I personally, I'm dyslexic and I have ADHD. And you'll hear me talk about that in a number of these videos. So I understand how hard it is. It's not that easy to just say, oh, I'm going to get this stuff done. But you have to develop strategies. And I'm constantly working and reworking through the strategies that I have since my ADHD diagnosis one year ago. Actually, it was now two years ago. I'll say more about that in a second. All right. So consider it Tuesday or Thursday. I'll try to get everything up on Sunday. All your due dates will be Friday and Sunday night. And then I'll start grading that week on Monday. And I will always try to have uh, full feedback to you before the beginning of the next module. I am Aaron Michael Ulry. When you interact with me, I want you to call me Dr. Ulry, though. Why? Well, I show solidarity with the women and people of color that struggle in the academy and regularly tell me in the academy that they can't get people to call them by their proper names. So Dr. Chavez becomes Dr. Amy. Well, maybe Dr. Amy doesn't want to be called Dr. Amy. She wants to be called Dr. Chavez, let alone just calling her by her first name. I'm making up the name Amy Chavez. So the point is, get to you, get in the use of calling me Dr. Ulry or me Professor Ulry. I don't really care. You can call me anything you want, but I just think this is an important precedent. And also one of the cool things, at least to me, is it's about professionalization. And you'll find by using these types of titles and getting used to using them, you will be able to more comfortably move through the world. So you address a professor always as professor so-and-so until they tell you you can use their first name. And they'll usually make a little joke about it. But trust me, there's, there's something there. All right, so how will you contact me? Now I'm available by Zoom, you could call me on the phone if you really need to, or by email. I will try my best to understand and accommodate your busy schedules. I work a lot. You work a lot. I know a lot of you are caring for family members, working several jobs, have extracurricular activities, are applying for med school, are doing blah, all of this stuff. We're all busy. We live in a busy world. So I think it's best for us to accommodate one another's busyness. And if you begin to get lost, behind, confused, need support, contact me immediately. I'm not one of these professors that just sticks by due dates and requirements with just an absolute rigid thing. You gotta get the work done for the class to be effective, but I wanna work with you. I'm your cheerleader. I'm your coach. I want you to get through this. I want you to learn a lot and gain a lot from this class. So please use my University of Houston email above. I will check email for a one hour window period daily. Compose your emails in formal English and strive toward professionalism and all correspondence with me and other students. An undergraduate degree is an exercise in professionalization. Practice writing formally and effectively. One of these days you're gonna have to write an email to make sure your kid gets their IEP in school or you're going to have to write an email to keep your job or you're going to have to write an email that does something incredibly important. And if you're not expressing yourself concisely, formally, and with power, you will not have those effects on your life. And that applies to every profession. Um, one little note, there is no set course time. Uh, I will be on Eastern Standard Time. You're seeing me right now, in the background here, I'm in my basement of my home in Denver, where my partner and I live. But I also live most of the time in Boston. So in Boston, I work for Harvard the University as a research associate and also as one of their online editors for the Center for the Study of World Religions. So your professor is also kind of a Harvard professor in his own way. I also work at Naropa, the Buddhist university in uh, Colorado, where I teach Sanskrit language courses and I teach seminars supporting master's thesis writing. So you can see editing, supporting people writing, writing's gonna be a big deal in this class and it is in my pedagogy. Okay, so let me describe this course for you. What is magic? Why are certain rites and beliefs considered magic or magical? How does magic ritual differ from orthodox ritual? How is a magic ritual I do in my backyard to bring forth my enemy different from a Catholic mass? Who are the practitioners of magic? 
What is witchcraft and what is sorcery? Big terms that we will unpack. How do magic rites and rituals re reflect and reify social categories, including gender, sexuality, and the body? Notions that will never be far from anything we look at. Does magic work? I think that's a great question. And does its effectiveness matter or not? I mean, maybe it doesn't need to work. Maybe it doesn't need to work to work even, as we'll see. Is magic found in the modern world? Do you see magic or anything that looks like the materials we see in this class in the modern world? I think you'll find you do. Magic is famously hard to define. When it is defined negatively, when it is considered illegal or immoral, then the term has negative and even lethal implications. Think about witch killings worldwide. The, the burnings of witches in Salem, Massachusetts. I've been out to Salem a couple times since I moved to the East Coast. And it's, it's an interesting and palpable place where you feel that. Or the fact that if you scour the news, people are killed due to witchcraft accusations at all time. And toward the end of the class, we're going to talk about the satanic panic in the 1980s and note that it is back in many ways and how accusations of Satanism has ruined people's lives. So the term magic, when it's defined carefully and used responsibly, as we will in this class, can organize practices for that study of magic to constitute and learn about lived religions around the globe. Instead of studying magic as something bad or something strange or something prohibited, in this course, we consider what magic operators in history and what they do today actually do. Magic is often interpreted to be the opposite of religion, and yet most religious lives contain rituals and experiences that can be defined as magic. Magic practices include pragmatic rites, you'll hear that term a lot, pragmatic rituals, that cause effects ranging from, so let me, let me say that again. Okay, magic practices, magic rituals can include the following types of things that are pragmatic. They cause a realistic change in the world and the self. So you have um, magic rituals that can cause love, that can cause murder, that can kill someone. Divination, understanding the, understanding the future or the present, astrology-based medicine, conjuring and transacting with invisible creatures, creating power bestowing diagrams, consecration of amulets, deploying and removing curses and diseases and weather control and so much more. The phrase pragmatic ritual technologies, which is how I use, which is the phrase I use to delimit what I study as magic in my own research, <laughs> will be used to identify magic topics. In fact, my own research is on a body of texts called the magic tantras, in Hinduism in particular, though they can be found in other sources that have um, sorcery, aggressive sorcery rites, means to create enchanted objects or have sort of magical powers or astounding powers. And finally, conjuring forth mostly female entities and spirit beings that will grant you your wishes and wealth. So students in this class We'll explore and evaluate many definitions of magic. That'll be a big part of the first part of the class. And then apply them to data sets that range from Greece to New Age bookstores today. Um, I will go at the end of this and I'll go very quickly through the topics we're gonna cover by week. No prior study or expertise is required. It helps if you had a religious studies class, but you know I'm gonna talk a lot about what is religious studies and how we do it toward the beginning. And um, yeah, you, you don't need to have a background. You can come to this completely Open and ready. All you need is a willing list to learn all sorts of kooky, weird stuff. And weird is good around here. Hopefully, I'll be able to get into the uh, etymology of the word weird, W-E-I-R-D. But if I don't, you should look up what that word weird really means, specifically tracing it back to uh, an old English W-Y-R-D spelling of the word weird. All right, so what's in the class? The first part of the class is going to set out terms and the stakes of studying pragmatic ritual technologies or magic and religious studies. And what is religious studies but the academic study of religion? The second part explores rites and spells from written sources, namely magic rituals. We will explore Greek love magic, highlighting what magic and Greek love magic reveals about social structures, gender, and sexuality. Greek rituals are then compared with the so-called six magic results, which are what I study in ancient India, especially those six magic results in the tantras. For the third part of the class, we're going to read two classic ethnographies, and this is a great section. One of which we're going to read is about the Upper Nile region of Africa in the early 20th century, and the other from rural France in the 1970s, where we see some very, very troubling ideas amongst people who in France who believe they are afflicted by witchcraft. 
Both ethnographies complicate notions of magic by exploring witchcraft and counter witchcraft. Witchcraft is a quality and force in the world as opposed to any specific ritual practices, i.e. witchcraft. The fourth part of the class, notice magic, witchcraft, occult, that's in the, the the name of the course in the class that's on the catalogs. I was pleased when it came to University of Houston to find uh, that that course was on the catalogs and I was able to bring my own thing into it. The versions of it that had been taught before were mostly about magic in the ancient world and about sort of verses in sort of the Christian and Jewish Bibles that refer to things that may or may not be considered magic. So in this course, we really are going from the ancient world right into the contemporary. So the fourth part examines contemporary Western notions of magic and esotericism, i.e. the occult, that which is hidden. This final topic explores varied occultures. I love this word. So occult cultures, cultures of the hidden, cultures of the secret, starting in the 19th century, expanding in the 20th, and evolving into the first quarter of the 20th century, we'll be talking about a thing called chaos magic on that topic. All right, so there are four books that are required, and here's the nice thing. Three of them are available through the UH library or we have scans of. So the first one is Evans Pritchard's classic book, Witchcraft, Oracles, and Magic Amongst the Zandi. It's an amazing text. Um, buy a copy if you can buy a copy of this one because it's sort of legendary. And for these books, purchase wherever you buy books. I'll see about getting them run through the UH bookstore, but there's always problems with that. Christopher Farone's An Ancient Greek Love Magic, which is a delightful book. Um, that can be downloaded through the UH library. Um, so that that one kind of explains itself. Love Magic in the Ancient World of Greece. Barbara Shava uh, Jean's book, Deadly Words, Witchcraft in the Bocage. This was a translated French text. This is the ethnography of rural France. It's complicated. It's hard. And every time I teach this class, I think about not teaching it again. And every time a bunch of students say, no, 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 no. I didn't like it at first, but you need to keep teaching that. It's really good. So I keep teaching it. And finally, uh, the one book you'll probably have to grab up physically is Witches of America by Alex Marr, which is a journalistic study. Now, there's going to be lots of materials that I provide you on Canvas. And I'm always interested in finding materials we can use that we do not have to pay for. Students are required, because it's an online class, to maintain reliable internet and access to a working computer device. A laptop or desktop is preferable. Generally, students that have worked on their phones and their tablets find all sorts of problems. They find that things don't get, they don't get, they don't get submitted right, they get submitted wrong, they don't save right, they often write things and lose them. So if at all possible, work on a laptop or a desktop. Now, it doesn't have to be your own laptop or desktop. You just have to have access to one of them. Should there be a movie uh, or documentary be, that I assign that is not based on YouTube, and there will be one, I believe, that's on Netflix, then students are responsible for acquiring access via streaming services. And ask your friends. Okay, how about some course outcomes? This is kind of this boring thing that we professors do to talk about our course outcomes, and I think they're more helpful for us as professors and thinking about them than they are for students. But for those of you who are students out there of education or intend to teach in your life, it's 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 really a good practice to kind of think about why you're doing anything in the classroom and then what or think why, if you were the professor, would they be doing what they're doing in the classroom? And stating these outcomes are kind of helpful. But you will be able to do all of these things when we get done with the class. First, you're going to use data sets in the assigned readings, so the course materials, to develop your own definitions of magic and evaluate other definitions of magic. Those definitions will be used to interpret all sorts of magic agendas and shape any research agendas you might have. Read with a purpose. I want you to be able to sort the important material from the non-important material. So if I assign you, and I sometimes will assign you a long assignment, you shouldn't read it all. You should figure out what's the most important stuff. And even if it's a short assignment, you should be making annotations and thinking to yourself, what's the most important thing? It's more important to think through the material and evaluate the material and figure out what's the most important than to just churn through the material. One thing that you will want to do is as you're reading, you'll locate material to be used in writing. Namely, you're developing reading for research methods. This is a big deal, and you'll hear me say this a lot, and I'll advise many of you to do this. Before you do the reading, before you watch the video, before you even look at the PowerPoints, read the assignments. That way you have in your head the assignments, whether it's a short essay or it's a discussion forum, which is called group writing, I'll get to that. Have it in your head and ready to go. 
That way, as you're reading along, you're like, oh, I can use that. Oh, I can use that. Oh, I can use that. Instead of getting to the end of your reading and watching the lecture and whatnot, and then you read the assignment and go, oh, wait, what was that thing? Read the assignments first. Always. Okay, <laughs> in every class. Okay, I want you to develop a robust vocabulary of such terms as sorcery, witchcraft, divination, execration, auspiciousness, consecration, and so forth. You are going to use such words and you're going to use them comfortably. And trust me, the material from this course will cause you to be a dinner party at some point this semester. And you'll start talking about your class and suddenly you will be the most interesting person in the room and everybody's going to want to hear about it. I make that promise to you. I guarantee you I will get an email from about a quarter of you telling me it happened. All right. Contrast active magic rituals from passive rituals of a witch. We'll get into this a little bit more. So um, magic sorcerers do rituals. Witches are thought to do rituals, but probably don't. That's kind of the important thing. Oh, I missed four. Apply theories on magic to definitions of religion, ritual, and divinity. Good things. I want you to be able to contrast emic perspectives. Those are the sources written from an insider's perspective or sources of literary or scriptural writing. And I want you to be able to contrast those with edict sources, like an ethnography, and edict sources written from an outsider looking in. You will identify methodologies in diverse sources, including the classics, anthropology, and religious studies. You'll engage multiple disciplines in course discussions, research, and writing. Okay. Assessments and assignments. Now, online courses require a lot of work. They take more time. They really do. The advantage of doing the course whenever you want over the week in your pajamas is accompanied by the fact that you, you have to do a lot of writing. Um, and the reason for that is when I've had when I've had less assessment, I found the students just didn't understand the materials as much. I don't use uh, like like uh, quizzes and what like, like that. I don't think those work online asynchronous. What I will ask you to do is the sorts of assignments I'm going to describe here. Okay, students are required to write regularly and are to write regular weekly assignments, including short writings, discussion posts or group writings, and exit tickets. I'll describe those each. These will constitute much, most of your grade. Students learn best online when they see material three times. When you first read it, when you see the lecture, and when you apply it to something. That does a whole big thing for retaining and understanding information. Students will also perform two presentations, one at the beginning of the course and one at the end of the class. They will also write a take-home final. I'm thinking of combining the final presentation take-home final, though. For the first presentation, students will present a topic from the course, any topic they want, to a social group of their choice. Coworkers, families, roommates, sports team, Sunday school, whatever. You turn it, you'll turn in a PowerPoint and a description of the experience, and that's it. But what usually comes out of this is a pretty vibrant discussion with whatever group you're talking to. All right, students will write a final exam, the prompt to be determined, accounted for 20% of the grades. These percentages are all approximate. So the standard UH grading scale apply. The nature of asynchronous online does not lend itself to large research projects or term papers. Previously, when I taught this in person, we had some just fantastic like 10 and 15 page like research assignments. But when I research papers written on all sorts of outside sources, but I just it just doesn't work. I, I've never been able to replicate those experiences in online ex asynchronous. So one of the reasons why you're doing so many little assignments is because you're not doing one big assignment. Though we will be writing online, students should approach all assignments and communication with professor and other students as if these were papers submitted in class, handed in on paper. Use standard grammar, spelling, and punctuation. Do not use acronyms or internet or tech speak. All written work should be revised at least once. I really recommend reading out loud everything you write before you hit the, su the submit button. That makes a big difference. Cut and paste should only, only be used when you're doing direct quotes, and all direct quotes must be cited appropriately. Students are expected to read every word assigned, wink, wink, though this is rarely possible in practice. I suggest students read with a purpose. Pre-read by skimming each text, then only read the most relevant materials to the topic. Read in details and take notes on important sources, especially when course materials are relevant for paper projects or for the assignments you'll be doing each week. Optional and recommended readings are truly optional. They're good for you, but I, I'm, not going, I'm not going to assess you on them. If your schedule permits, reading the group and short writing assignments before doing the reading may help to focus your reading and note taking. Forget that if your schedule permits. Read the assignments first before you do the reading. 
Okay, supporting multimedia videos and news articles are meant to support the lecture, warming up the students for lecture topics. Whenever possible, videos will show rituals and practices, portray religious sites, or support discussion and sorts on short assignments. Lectures in general were very in range. And like, they will always have PowerPoint, audio, and video. I'm an energetic speaker, and I hope you'll find the lectures enjoyable. Most students enjoy them. Do not expect a monotone voice over a dreary PowerPoint. I'm committed to bringing my high-impact performances from the lecture hall directly to your computer screen. I will make sure you have a PDF of the PowerPoint uh, before you watch the lecture. Those will be embedded all the time. You'll always have your PowerPoints first. Discussion boards, in fact, online are not really discussions. They promise to stimulate in-person discussion, but they don't. Discussion boards in this class, I call group writing projects. You'll be asked to write an original pro, uh, an original post and then use the reply functions to expand other students' posts. Refrain from passing judgments such as, I think this is good or proclaiming value, this is interesting. Your task is to expand the prior posts, making further arguments, providing more data or critiquing the arguments and further and asking further questions. Often, you'll be required to cite sources and bring in further research to support your posts and also your replies. Again, this is not really a discussion per se because discussions are fast. They move back and forth. They change a lot. You know, they're really dynamic. This is like I'm writing one thing, you're writing one thing. So it's more like you're doing a group writing task or writing as a group. I know people freak out about the word group writing. Don't worry, I'm. As a group writing task, everybody gets their own individual grade and is not assessed on the work of others. Uh, discussion boards will also be used for paper writing and project support. So I'll ask you like for your presentation, like what is your project? How are you gonna do it? Blah, blah, blah. And then I can give you individual feedback and you can see my feedback from other people um, there. It, it ends up being really useful to use these discussion forums for, um, for writing support. Each group writing assignment will have a rubric and while these are group writing assignments, students will only be assessed on their own on their own performance. Many modules will also contain short writing assignments, mostly informal and creative using multiple styles and genres. These tasks include writing for a school paper or a letter to your friend or a movie pitch or an anthropology world a field, or a field report from anthropology. Maybe writing some poems. We'll do a lot. They'll be really wild and different. You'll also be asked to make memes. Everybody loves the make a meme assignment and occasionally make some videos. Assignments require students to engage the contents and then react from their own perspective or compare contents to your own experiences. The goal is for you to reprocess the materials and do something with them. Application applying concepts and contents actively will dramatically increase comprehension and recall. Each short writing assignment will have a rubric. All assignments are designed to build skills that will be used in formal writing assignments, either here or in other courses. Community is really hard to build online and professors struggle when they cannot directly interact with their students in person. I, I feel this every semester. This being the case, you will be assigned a weekly assessment of the class, which is called an exit ticket. You'll just be asked, you know, assess the class, its contents, its readings, its videos, its activities. And then second sentence, assess yourself. And you can really write, it was good. I didn't like it. I'd want to take a nap. That's good, you'll get full points. So these don't have a word count or a rubric. If you do them, you'll get full points. They're easy points. I use these in several ways to adjust the course design as I'm going along, to adjust the readings and the assignments, also to nuance my assessment of student performances. And often I just use them to interact with students about the course in their lives. Sometimes students just ask me questions and I can write to them about it, or they can tell me about having a shitty week and I can kind of be, and I can support them on that. My support goes like, yeah, that sucks. But, you know, sometimes when you kind of don't have a great week and you try to do your best on an assignment and you just don't do that well, and then you write about it and you tell the professor, it kind of feels a little bit better. And sometimes they might uh, take a little bit of pity on you as well. So do the, uh, do the exit tickets and see them as a way to just interact with me. Um, a lot of students, well, not a lot, but I'd say about a quarter of the students really, I end up writing me pretty substantial exit tickets and we just kind of talk about what's going on. Um, I'm not really the type of professor that wants to sit around and talk extensively, you know, with students about their personal lives. I'm, I'm just saying I'm not that professor, but I am a professor who cares about his students and, and I care about their well-being. And I, I want to be able to understand when they're struggling and support them in any way I can. OK, students are encouraged to make use of the UH Writing Center for longer assignments, though the writing 
Center might be of aid in any of the assignments in this course. As you can see, the model tasks above um, <laughs> cause students to process course materials four times. First, three, I said three, but it's kind of four. First, you read it, then you watch the lecture, then you might do a group writing, then you might do a short writing. Usually it's one or the other. Furthermore, there are lots of chances to acquire points. And I build in lots of special ex extra credit options. I've never had a student do poorly in this class who had done all the week, the work. I mean, it's just, I think if you just do all the work, the, the lowest you could get would be a C. That might not what, be what you want to hear. But if you just do everything, you're, you'll are you probably get a B. Um, and if you do anything with, with, if you do everything, like absolutely everything, and you do it with relatively decent, you know, effort into it, it's it's not hard to do well in this class. If you don't do stuff, not turning assignments, that's that's why students do poorly in my class. It's it's never that they have performed consistently poorly on assignments. It's more that they just haven't done the work. Uh, we will address the use of AI and ChatGPT in the first few weeks. You may use these sources, but you must always source them, and you may not whole scale copy and paste from them. Remember that the best way to avoid inadvertent plagiarism is to never use copy and paste. Just don't copy and paste ever. If any part of your writing has used copies and paste, unless it is a direct quote with citation, you must completely rework the passage into your own words and cite anything you have used, copy and paste, including AI, according to academic conventions. Should there be a pattern of AI use, I've developed a number of policies to address this problem and I will implement them and they will make all our lives more complicated. All right, policy regarding plagiarism. All assignments submitted must represent students' own work. Plagiarism is a serious offense. If you use the words or ideas of others without proper citation of your source, you may be you could be suspended or even expelled from the university. I've even heard that places like UH, if there's a straw, if there's a pattern of cases of plagiarism accusations, will put a little mark by your courses. Uh, and then if you're going to say med school uh, and they're looking at your transcripts and they see those marks, they know exactly what they mean. And if they see a pattern of plagiarism accusations, your, your application might leave the pile of consideration. All right. I take this very seriously. And if I suspect you have included any amount of material from uncredited sources, I'll investigate vigorously. Just don't do it. Don't copy and paste ever in any of your assignments. Copy and paste is at the root of almost all accidental plagiarism. Do not mine internet sources for the material in your assignments. Just read the stuff I tell you to read and then write your material based on that. Using outside sources always gets students in trouble. Well, not always, but often. Anytime you use information from a website or an online source or a book, you must either quote it directly and cite, or you must rewrite and paraphrase and cite. This includes any use of AI, any instance of plagiarism, can amount to dramatic repercussions, not excluding failing from the class and even expulsion from the university. I always prefer evidence and quotes from course materials that I assigned rather than outside sources. There will be a few times when I'll ask you to look for outside research or outside sources, those are different. I will enable anti-plagiarism software on all of your assignments, which will check your work against other UH students, student paper databases worldwide and across sites on the internet. Should the software flag student writing, I will initiate an investigation. Note, if you are a student with, an, with a documented disability and would like to discuss special accommodations, please contact me during office hours at the beginning of the course or email or whatnot, and we'll talk about it. You'll find a lot of the accommodations in IEPs <coughs> don't really apply to this course because we're not using a lot of timed things and the assignments are pretty well spread out. But contact me regardless. Uh, if you are an ESL student, English as a second language, please discuss this with me. If you do not self-advocate, I cannot help you. I take these accommodations very seriously and will do my best to help you. Understand that I understand the hardships of writing in a foreign language since my own work involves me learning numerous modern and archaic Asian languages. All right, here's all the material that UH says I have to put on here. I'm not going to read that. Okay, so the course is on magic, specifically magic rituals. Now, let me quick talk through the contents and we'll be done for the day. This is also one of the longer videos we're gonna have. I'm, I'm working on a couple of things with video editors and whatnot. The first half of the course, I um, I have long videos. And then the second half, I've already recorded short videos. And I'm working on getting those video, the longer videos edited right. If I don't get them edited right, then you'll still have the long videos. But halfway through, they'll get short, I swear. Uh, okay, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna think about what is religious studies? What is religion? What is the academic study of religion? How's that different from practicing religion? How's that different from doing theology? 
in a way we'll be embrace, embracing the anthropology of religion versus the theology of religion. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about uh, social magic and stage magic. So what is magic in general and how does it differ from sort of the magic tricks that we see on TV? And what is the difference between performing magic and having magical powers or mental powers or psychic powers? We'll move into a study of magic in ancient Greek and medieval India. There we will discuss various forms of Greek love magic. This is a really vibrant section of the class. And then we'll move into actually looking at my own research on magic rituals in South Asia. Then we'll move into ethnography and we're going to read about the world of sorcery and witchcraft amongst the Azandi in 1920s. And it is a truly different way to think about the world causality and being than we modern folk do. But the longer you think about this material, the longer you will be able to inhabit the world. And my students usually about halfway through this section start seeing how they could use the exact same rhetoric that these that these um, that the that the Azandi use in order to kind of make sense of their own world. So it really challenges our notion of materialism uh, and science when we can see alternate views of the world that are logically coherent. If there's one thing to be said about the non-modern human being, it's not that they are irrational, as so many modernist thinkers said when they talked about the minds of the savages. No, people who are not modern are not irrational. They're completely rational, but they operate out of a different set of suppositions and a different set of assumptions about the world than the modern scientifically minded person does. All right, we will continue to talk about uh, divination and ways of discerning the future or discerning what which is messing with you. And then we are going to talk a little bit more openly about different versions of divination. And there I'm gonna to talk to you a whole bunch about um, tarot and a number of a number of interesting Chinese sort of spect sort of understandings of divination. Okay, then we are going to move into talking about witchcraft in France. And this is a different set and understanding witchcraft that is has some similar themes to Evans Pritchard, but is very different. We'll move on through that into our final section, which is on magic in the contemporary world. We're going to talk about witches in America, those people who consider themselves neo-pagans or esotericists. Um, and we're going to look at a whole bunch of different groups of them. We're going to look at the rise of fraternal orders, such as the Freemasons and um, different esoteric orders, so secret orders like the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn in the late 19th century, and how those sort of mystic underground societies really created what we see moving forward into the 20th century. In the 20th century, we're going to discuss the magic of Aleister Crowley uh, and his groups that are called, they call themselves Thelemites, those who believe in Thelema, which means the will. And we have a pretty exciting section, I think, on the holy guardian angel. You're going to think about angels way differently than you've ever thought of before. I had a lot of Christians and Catholic students say, Wait a minute, after thinking about the way these sorcerers and esotericists think about angels, I'm thinking about my angels a lot more clearly, which is kind of cool. All right, then we're going to talk about contemporary magical communities and magical teachers, including the formation of the formation and deployment of a ritual called the Gnostic Mass. That's a pretty interesting era. We're going to close up by discussing contemporary magic in the world or postmodern magic and also talk about the satanic panic in the 1980s that is re-emerging even now. This is the fear that your neighbor is a witch and a Satanist and then making accusations of that. And then suddenly their lives fall apart. We'll look into a couple of important cases there. And finally, chaos magic, which is purely postmodern DIY magic. We'll look at how contemporary chaos magicians do things like conjure up dinosaurs or conjure up marble heroes or conjure up their dearly departed grandfather and then deploy them in specific rituals. And then they just say to themselves, did it work? And I did it again, did it work again? Well, then it's real. So you can deploy any cultural set into chaos magic. Okay, that is the class. So we're gonna have a great semester. I'm looking forward to getting to know you all. It's gonna be a hoot. Um, I think you're gonna like it. Thanks for taking the class and uh, we're gonna have a good time. All right, bye-bye now.